What's going on everybody? I'm Johnny Brook. Welcome back to another Crafted Workshop video and welcome back to my kitchen. So in this week's video, I'm gonna show you how I built this humongous ingrain cutting board that we're using as our island countertop. I love the way this came together. I was actually able to reclaim an old dining table top we had and I think it really turned out awesome. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the project. So in case you missed my video a few weeks ago, I built and installed the countertops for our main counter areas in our kitchen. And with those done, I wanted to work on something slightly different for our island, basically a large ingrain cutting board top. And since this island is the main working surface in our kitchen, I figured making the countertop out of something we could cut things on directly would be pretty ideal. So I moved forward with that idea. So when picking out the material for this cutting board top, I looked around my shop and remembered that I had kind of been hoarding this old butcher block tabletop. So this is the table my parents owned when I was a kid and the date on the bottom actually showed that this table was made in 1996. So the table had since been passed along to my wife and I after my parents got a new table and then it was relegated to storage once the next generation of kitchen tables was passed along through our family. I figured I could repurpose the top into something cool and today was finally the day for that. So I started by hoisting the extremely heavy top up onto my table saw with the help of my buddy Eddie so that I could cut it down into a more manageable size. And my main goals here were to rip the top in half so it could fit through my planer and I also wanted to rip off these heavily rounded edges. So after cutting the top down, I ran the pieces through my planer to remove the finish and I probably should have tried sanding some of this finish off first, as I'm sure whatever finish was used was pretty rough on my planer knives, but it still cleaned up the pieces like a champ. With the faces of the pieces cleaned up, I could move on to cross cutting the pieces into strips so that I could turn this into an ingrain butcher block top. So before cutting, I did some math to figure out how I could use the pieces most efficiently while still ending up with a top the size I wanted, which was roughly 26 and a half inches by 39 inches long in my case. And I wanted to keep the top as thick as possible, hence all of this math. Once I figured out my thickness, I first cross cut the pieces in half, again, just to make them a little bit more manageable. And then I could start cross cutting them into a bunch of strips. And I kept the strips matched up as I cut them so that any color variations would kind of flow through the top once I turned the pieces on edge. After a bunch of cross cutting, I had the strips cut, but I needed to do some maintenance on a few of the strips where whatever glue the original manufacturer of this top had used had failed. So fixing these strips was simple enough. I just added some fresh wood glue, type bond two in my case, which is food safe and water resistant. And then I clamped the pieces together. While that piece dried, I could work on arranging the rest of the strips into the final pattern. And I started by turning each strip 90 degrees so that the ingrain was facing up and then I flipped every other strip end over end, which results in this kind of checkerboard pattern that's so common in ingrain cutting boards like these. And I made sure to check for any major defects at this point as well, and I really lucked out for the most part. These pieces were pretty clean. With the boards arranged, I could move on to the big glue up. And I used way, way too much glue here, but these pieces definitely are not coming apart anytime soon. I also made sure to check for flatness as these clamps can definitely put quite the bow in your piece if you aren't careful. After letting the glue dry overnight, I came back, removed the clamps, and then scraped off the ridiculous amount of excess glue from the pieces. I mostly focused on the glue on the bottom as I'd be running these pieces through the planer again, and I really just needed one flat reference surface. Speaking of which, planing ingrain cutting boards like these is definitely a topic of debate, but I've never personally had an issue with it. That said, work at your own risk and do your own research here. I personally found that one of the main keys to success when planing these types of pieces is to heavily chamfer the trailing edge, i.e. the edge that will be the last area planed. And this chamfer will help a ton with reducing chip out on that edge, although this wasn't as big of a deal for me since I'd be trimming these to length later on. The other key to success when planing in grain is to take very light passes, especially if your planer has straight knives. Luckily, my planer has carbide inserts, which have an easier time with in grain, but it's still a good idea to take it nice and slow. After cleaning up the two sections of the planer, I was trying to decide how I wanted to glue these sections back together, and I had a good bit of extra width to work with. So after thinking about it for a bit, I figured that cutting the edges at an angle could add a really interesting pattern to the final cutting board. So I started laying out where I'd make my cuts on the pieces. To make these cuts, I pulled out my track saw, but this particular track saw really isn't designed to cut through this thick of material. This is over two inch thick maple ingrain. 
Luckily, I also own the bigger brother to this track saw, and it made really quick work of this cut. That said, if you don't have a track saw powerful enough to make a cut like this, you can probably freehand the cut at the bandsaw and then clean it up with a hand plane, or you could rig up a jig at the table saw. After cutting the angle on one edge and squaring up one end to that edge, I could rip the other edge parallel to the angled edge at the table saw. And I could have used the track saw again here, but the table saw just ensures that the two edges are perfectly parallel to each other. After ripping, I checked the end for square, which it was, and then I could move on to the glue up. And kind of on the fly, I decided to add an accent strip in the middle of the top, and I used a leftover piece of thermally modified ash for this. And this specific wood type is extremely dimensionally stable and is also really water resistant, which are both pretty great qualities in a cutting board. So I glued the strip to one of the two halves and then passed the piece through the planer again off camera just to flush the strip up perfectly with that main top and then I could glue the two halves together. And I wanted to make sure things stayed perfectly aligned here just to avoid any extra sanding later on, so I added a few dominoes to help with this. The dominoes also added a little bit of strength to this joint, although the glue is really plenty strong for that. After marking out the domino locations and cutting the mortises, I added some glue and clamped the two halves together, bonding them for good. Once the glue had dried and I had taken the cutting board out of the clamps, I was about to trim both ends square but stopped short after looking at the end with the two angles. Something about the look of the two angled ends coming together in this kind of subtle point really stuck out and I decided to keep as much of this point as I could while still cleaning up the end of the board. I also squared up the other end of the board while I was at it, once again calling on the track saw which again made quick work of this. So with that, all that was left was some finish prep, which is always pretty time consuming when working with ingrain. I worked my way up from 80 grit to 180 grit, sanding all of the faces of the board. I also chamfered the edges while I was at it. And I like using a block plane for this, as I tend to get a cleaner cut than I do with a router. One step I inadvertently skipped was raising the grain, which I think is a really good idea on ingrain cutting boards like this and the water will cause the wood fibers to stand up, leaving you with a rougher surface, and once removed, your smooth surface will stick around even after washing. Anyway, after finish prep, I could move on to my favorite part of cutting board building, adding the finish. So once again, I wanted this to be a food safe surface, so I started by adding a heavy coat of mineral oil, which this maple completely soaked up. After letting the mineral oil absorb for a few hours, I came back and added a few coats of this butcher block conditioner, which contains mineral oil along with some natural food safe waxes, including carnauba wax. And these waxes will just help to prevent the mineral oil from being washed away from the countertop, which will just mean less frequent reapplication of finish on my part. So with that, I could head back to the house to get the cutting board installed on the island. I started by adding a few scraps of 3 quarter inch plywood, which act as spacers, filling in the gap between the internal structure of the cabinets and the bottom of the cutting board. I also drilled a few oversized holes through these spacers, and these holes will just allow for seasonal wood movement without constricting the top. Finally, I moved the cutting board into place, got it centered on the cabinets, and then clamped it in place before adding screws from below. I made sure to pre-drill the holes here to avoid splitting the top, and I used 2.5 inch screws to attach the top to the cabinets. And it's definitely a little bit awkward getting at these locations for these screws, but eventually I got them all installed and I could call this cutting board island complete. Now let's fast forward a few weeks and I'll show you how the top looks after some use. And it's been about a month since I originally installed it. And as you can see, the color is lightened up a bit, meaning that some of that finish has been washed away. And I figured I'd just go ahead and show you the process of applying more finish while you're here. That said, you'll probably only need to reapply once or twice a year, depending on how much you use your top. So since I have a random orbit sander here at the house, I used that with some 320 grit sandpaper to really smooth out the top, and then I just applied another coat of the butcher block conditioner after sanding. And if you don't have a powered sander, you can easily get by with hand sanding here, as you're really not looking to remove much material just to smooth things out. Anyway, with that done, I could call this project finished. All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. I really liked the way this all came together. It was great to be able to use that old dining table top that I'd kind of been hanging on to for probably over a year at this point, and I think it was perfect for this. So if you guys are interested in building something like this yourself, I'll have links to all the tools and materials I use down in the video description below. And last, if it's your first time here, why not go ahead and get subscribed, ring that little notification bell, and check out this other video that YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. All right, thanks for watching, everybody, and until next week, happy building.